Welcome to the yet another cool talk at the .next Moscow 2021. And I'm happy to announce our speakers, Samara Heward and Kevin Sheldrake. Hi, guys, and thanks for joining. I believe it's quite different different time zones you are in, and it's pre pretty much like it's almost evening here. But what's about you? Early morning or what? It's uh, in Seattle. It's, well, I don't know about early... 8.30 a.m., somewhere around there. Uh, it's very early for me, for a late bird like me. And Kevin, what about you? Uh, it's uh, half past four in the afternoon here in Cheltenham in the UK. Okay, UK is closer to us. So but thanks for joining. And uh, it's cool to have like such an international, I would say, meeting if I were at work, but we are not at work. So it's like a talk. So And I would say that this is very um, unusual talk because we will be talking, or you will rather be talking about having sysinternals tools on Linux. And this is happening on the .NET conference. I wouldn't imagine that it about that happening like a year probably ago. We all know that .NET runs on Linux, but sysinternals has always been associated with Windows. So how do you feel about that? I mean, I believe it was a tremendous amount of work to bring all that stuff, on, I mean, not all, but most of this stuff to Linux. So how do you feel about that being at the .NET conference with such a talk? Yeah, yeah no, I very... mean, I think, yeah, go ahead, Kevin. Oh, sorry, it's, it's very exciting. Uh, uh, I mean, um, I have a Linux background, so it's my first time at a Windows conference or a .NET conference at all. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, SysInternals is a, I, I mean, I think most people kind of know what that's all about. It celebrated 25 years just last week, right? Um, so it is super exciting. Um, while you may not think that SysInternals for Linux um, is uh, specifically targeted at .NET. There are a couple of things, and we'll talk about those later today uh, or later in the session, that we would have some integration with .NET. So, yeah, super excited. Cool. And then let's get started with the talk and then deep dive into what you have prepared for us. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. So, um, Good morning, good afternoon, good evening across all these different time zones. And welcome to this talk on sysinternals for Linux. Uh, my name is Mario Hewart. I'm a principal customer engineer at Microsoft. I've been with the company for, um, I think, a little over 20 years at this point and been in a, a lot of different roles at Microsoft, all related to software engineering. Um, but the consistent theme for, for me over my tenure has been around diagnostics and debugging and the low level stuff, right? Understanding the um, the system underneath you basically. Um, and so as part of that, um, I kind of went on this mission to see if I can um, help others um, sort of leverage the things that I've learned over the years. And so I wrote a couple of books on it. One is advanced Windows debugging and advanced .NET debugging. And I've also done some uh, diagnostics and plural site courses uh, that, are, that are out there. Um, and with me today is another SysInternals for Linux developer. Kevin, do you want to give an intro? Yeah, yeah. so I'm Kevin Sheldrake. Um, I've only been in Microsoft a few years, but uh, my background was in penetration testing and security research, where I pretty much specialized in uh, Linux and Unix platforms. Um, you may have seen some of my talks at various other conferences on uh, breaking things rather than making things. And um, I've also published in uh, POC or GTFO, uh, which is in the third actual printed book, um, but isn't in the uh, OX18 PDF, if you want to get it, talking about how um, you can teach children how to hack using Scratch, which is a, a little fun thing that I did. Um, but in Microsoft, yeah, I, I've specialized in Linux and I'm a security software engineer. Uh, building tools for sysinternals. So, um, yeah, so we have tools Procmon and Procdump as well as uh, Sysmon for Linux, which we launched last week. In the second half of this uh, talk, I'll be talking more about uh, the eBPF internals, how EBF, eBPF works itself and how we're using it within sysinternals and hopefully um, give some information that others might be able to make use of or, or inspire more use of. Um, so 
I'll talk first about Sysmon for Linux. Um, Sysmon has been around for a number of years on Windows. It's been by Mark Rosinovich and Thomas Garnier, plus um, multiple other, other people um, adding and, and fixing things and providing extra functionality. Over the last uh, sort of nine months or so, I've been porting that to Linux. And I've taken, well, so rather than rewrite it from scratch or invent a new tool that looks a bit like Sysmon, um, we, we, I've actually ported across um, large chunks of the Sysmon code. Now, obviously, the Windows version uses a driver in order to get access to the telemetry information it needs to make events. And on Linux, oh, that's not something we could do. Now, we could have made a kernel module, but there's compatibility issues, stability issues, and, and other deployment issues related with making kernel modules, especially if you don't want to have to uh, recompile against, against your machine. So instead, we invented the Sysinternals eBPF library, which was developed hand in hand with Sysmon. And this library allows us to load and control eBPF programs. And it also comes with a eBPF code library of inline functions that can be incorporated into uh, eBPF programs, which makes use of the functionality that the library offers. So it kind of goes hand in hand, the two, the two sides of the coin. That uh, using that, we developed the eBPF programs that Sysmon uses to run inside the Linux kernel and generate the telemetry that we need in order to make events. Um, we can support from kernel 4.15 onwards. And uh, that information comes back through the library, back to the user land Sysmon for Linux program, where it then outputs that information to Syslog, where you can then collect it in your seam. Uh, and and therefore, you know, check how your system's running, you know, hunt for threats, etc. Can I have the next slide, please, Mario? Um, so it's Sysmon for Linux. I mean, for those who don't know, Sysmon is a is a system monitoring tool, and we've implemented a number of the events that you would have on Windows. Um, so obviously, we have server state change and configuration change, which are kind of information about how Sysmon is running. And then we have the main events, process creation and termination, um, network connections for TCP and UDP, uh, file creations and file deletions, uh, raw access to block devices, and the situation where a process might access another process, i.e. using the ptrace um, interface. Uh, as I said before, we ported rather than rebuilt it. So it uses the same configuration loading and the same filtering engine as the Windows version. So if you've already used Sysmon on Windows and have made your own configurations and have some idea about how that um, how to configure it, then you can use exactly the same skills on Linux to make it work uh, in the same way. And uh, the output is in the same XML format that we output to Windows events. So if you can collect it from Syslog, then you can parse it using the same XML parser that you would have used on Windows. So now I'll pass back over to Mario, uh, who's going to talk about Procmon. Yes, you're there. I could hear Mario. Is it Mario? Sorry, it appears that we might have lost Mario. I, I could hear him just just then, but maybe he's uh, not available. Mario is... Oh, okay. So, uh, Mario, could you uh, advance the slides? Apparently, um, we have lost... Um, oh, right, let, let's do a demo instead, and we'll see whether we can get Mario back. Um, let me load. Let me load. Share my screen. Sorry about this, um, everyone. Um, hopefully, <laughs> you can see my terminal windows. Um, so, if I was to monitor the syslog on uh, on this terminal, and here I can start up syslog. Um, Um, I'm going to use a 
um, is a configuration file that just logs all all the different types of events. Doesn't really do a great deal of filtering. Um, you see, it gives a startup message. We can see in the syslog that a number of things are happening, and already the the system started running. Um, now, if we were to um, you know, create cause a process to start, we we can see events here in XML. And if and what I will do is I'll quickly zoom this screen so we can see roughly what these sort of things look like. Um, these events are uh, clearly XML and, and not the easiest things to read. So instead, what I will do is I'll pipe that through a program that uh, I built to go with Sysmon that makes it a little bit easier to, to read. And so now we can sort of see our events have been um, translated out of the XML and in, into a bit more English. So with a, with a process creation event, we can see the image that was run, uh, the command line that was run, um, the, the logon ID, the user, et cetera. And we have the same kind of logon GUIDs and process GUIDs that you would have um, within the Windows world. Obviously, some areas uh, of the events we uh, we don't fill in because they're very Windows specific. But at the moment, we're using uh, an event structure that is one for one mapped to to Windows. But we can see that running. If we were to do something that a piece of malware might want to do, a piece of malware might want to uh, go and grab a file from the internet, for example, we'd see a number of events occur. Um, and if we were to say scroll back. Oops, scroll back a little bit. We would see early on there'll be uh, the create process event um, of the wget with the uh, with the with the command line here. And as it went on, a number of network connections were created where it was um, attempting to get DNS information. Um, eventually, culminating in a connection to the web server on port 443. Um, you can see the image, of course, and the user and TCP, etc. Et cetera, um, culminating with a file being created by the wget process, and it dropped uh, index.html, which, which it got from, from wget. So um, if you had you know, a, a piece of an, an attack on your system or a piece of malware, one of the things it might do is go and get a file from the internet and store it. They might then run it. And obviously we would see those events all coming through. Um, let's go back to the slides. Oops. Um, so if we, if, if I can hear you, Mario. Yeah, but apparently, Kevin, uh, the we here cannot hear Mario. So I cannot hear Mario either. So that's why the... So you can hear him, but the audience does not. OK. Yeah. So sure. maybe... So, sorry. So maybe we having... should just reconnect uh, everything, and then uh, that would have solved the the problem. Yeah. But we, so we... we're having a few technical issues with uh, Mario's connection to the stream. Uh, I think Mario might be uh, trying to reconnect. So hopefully he'll be back. But he would normally talk about this uh, this slide, the next few slides. But instead, I'll I'll fill in and talk about things I know. So Procmon for Linux is a a rebuild of the Procmon tool available on Windows which is a process monitor. It's a very light way of monitoring system activity in a different interactive kind of fashion. So if you imagine that Sysmon is more of a system management tool where it's um, sending the information to your logs, for, which you can then mine and, and, uh, and, and, and look through for information, kind of like um, searching or historical. Procmon is much more of an interactive tool which traces access to the syscalls by all processes. And from the interactive screen, you can um, narrow down onto a single process or, or look for certain types of information. It's uh, also built on eBPF. And it, uh, it's available on GitHub. You can get it from uh, this internal GitHub, same place you can get um, Sysmon. Uh, 
Um, Mario was going to do, do, do a demo, and uh, if he gets back on before the end of the talk, then hopefully he will do a demo. Otherwise, he will record it and make it available so um, you can uh, find it through another means. I'm sure the organizers will find a way of publicizing that. Another tool he was going to talk about was Proc Dump for Linux. And uh, and again, this is a rebuild of a tool that you would have on Windows called Proc Dump. And um, now, Proc Dump will generate core dumps, core files from running processes without killing them. So if you have processes that appear to be running awry and you want to um, look into, you know, debug them, you might not want to debug them live because obviously it stops the process. But what you might want to do is take a core dump um, and then let, allow the process to continue and then mine the core dump with um, your favorite debugger to find out what, what's happening. Ah, I believe Mario might be back. Can you all, can you all hear me? Awesome. Sorry about that. I have no idea what happened there. Um, so where I, I just basically rejoined Kevin. So did, okay, I've, we... just, I've just been talking about Frockmon. Would you like to do your Frockmon yeah. demo? Okay, I'll do I'll the demo. My, I'll stop my screen share. Let me uh, go and see here. I can share my screen. All right. So Procmon, let me get the screen back in here. Um, just like Kevin mentioned, a, a really good way to, to be um, looking at system activity in the form of syscalls the processes are making. So in order to run it, um, well, first of all, you got to install it. I already have it installed, so I won't run it again. But on Ubuntu, you would do something as sim simple as sudo apt install Procmon. Um, and to run it, it does require root. So you would run sudo Procmon. And it brings up the Procmon TUI. And as you can see here up in the top right, it's collecting all these events for all the processes that are running on the system and every single syscall that it's making. So let me just hit F5 and just suspend it for now while I talk about it. So each of these rows here represents an event. And the event in this case is a syscall that a process is invoking. So for example, here we have SSHD um, making a call to RT underscore sig proc mask. It will tell you when it happened, uh, the process ID of SSHD, um, the syscall itself, the result, the time it took, and then also the inbound arguments that, that goes to that syscall. If you want to get a little bit more information about each of the these events, you can just hit enter on it. Um, and you will notice that you will get um, in addition to the, the previous information, you also get a stack trace. Uh, stack traces is going to depend on, uh, much much like in the Windows world, right? whether the right debug metadata is available. Um, in this case, for SSHD, it's not. But if it were, you would get a nice complete call stack, which can be really, really useful when you're sort of trying to look for that needle in a haystack. A couple of other things in here. Um, like I said, this generates a ton of information for every process, for every syscall. Um, if you wanted to kind of hone in on specific things, you can do F4 for filter. And let's say I just wanted to get SSHD. And now I'm only looking at SS the SS SSHD process um, in Procmon. Another kind of cool thing is um, if you hit F8 for stats, it will give you some statistics around the top syscalls by total duration. So in this case, the few takes quite common, right, is um, taken up the most and uh, poll, epoll, way, p-select. If you, if you think that a process is spending way too much time in any given syscall, this is a great way of finding out which one of the big hitters are. Um, lastly, just a quick note, F6 will export the data set and uh, we currently use today uh, SQLite to store all this thing. So if you hit F6, um, it will dump it out to file, and you can use the SQLite CLI to go and um, query the data um, and analyze farther if, if you prefer doing it offline and outside of the TUI. So that's kind of a quick um, lap around Procmon. And 
with that, let me switch back. And I believe Kevin talked a little bit about proc dump. It's essentially a way of generating um, these static process snapshots. On Windows, they're called crash dumps. On Linux, they're called core dumps. Um, we have mechanisms today already where you can generate core dumps on Linux. The power of proc dump, though, comes from the fact that you can tell proc dump to monitor processes. And you can specify triggers as it's monitoring. So when a trigger hits, it will automatically generate a core dump for you, which is a really powerful mechanism when, when you're looking at problems that aren't easily reproducible and that happen sporadically um, in production, for example. So once every three days, at some point, my process ends up just spiking the CPU to 95%, right? I don't know when it's gonna happen, so I can tell Procdom to monitor that process and then as, as it reaches that threshold that I specified 95%, it will jump, it will um, automatically generate a core dump. One of the things that we did um, six to eight months ago is that we did an integration with .NET Core, so .NET Core 3.x and higher. When you generate a core dump um, on Linux, it will dump out everything that the process is using and consuming, right? So those dumps can be Come quite large. In the case of .NET, since it's a managed runtime, um, the runtime will pre-allocate a whole bunch of memory. Um, for example, like the .NET heap manager will, assuming that you're going to use some later on, it'll be very, very quick to get that memory. So by default, if you just trigger a dump for a .NET Core app or a .NET app, it will generate a core dump that's large, very, very large, right? And that can be a little bit of a hassle, especially in production where you're going to have to take a multi-gig file off a production machine and ship it over to your um, dev box for post-mortem analysis, right? Um, so .NET, Core, or .NET as a runtime exposes this, its own ability to generate core dumps, and it will only include the things that it, that it needs, um, that is used, so that you can more efficiently debug those core dumps um, in the .NET environment. So proc dump integrates with .NET and you don't have to do anything to enable it. We detect if the process that you're targeting is a .NET app. And if it is, we will use that other mechanism and tell the runtime to generate the core dump instead. And it will result in substantially smaller dumps than if you were to just use the regular mechanism. Um, so we've got the, this is the, the GitHub, location of proc dump, um, like we mentioned before, all sys internals for Linux tools are completely open source. Everything we do is out on GitHub. So um, if you're interested in, in learning more or if you want to help contribute, then um, this is the place for it. Let's do a quick demo of proc dump. Um, so much like uh, procmon, to install it, you do sudo apt install proc dump. Already got it installed, so I'm not going to do that. Um, and then to run it, you got to be root. So you'd go sudo proc dump. And you're presented with a banner, right? So here are some of the things that we support in terms of triggers. CPU triggers above or below a CPU threshold to automatically generate a core dump. Say, same thing for memory. So if you got an app that's going crazy on, on memory, you can use this to get the core dump. When thread count exceeds a certain value, um, when file descriptor count exceeds a, a certain value. Um, and also we added this very, very recently up on, you know, there's a lot of people requesting this. You can tell proc dump to monitor the process. And if a signal, the signal that you specify is ever encountered, it will also generate a core dump. So with that, let's say that uh, I'm, I'm just going to run, oops, HTOP in the background. And if I wanted to generate a core dump of HTOP, uh, we first have to get the process ID. So it's a lot of different ways you can do that on Linux. I use PS for simplicity. We can find our HTOP instance. And this is the process ID. So we run sudo proc dump dash P, specify the process ID. And you'll notice that goes into monitoring mode, but because we didn't specify any triggers, it's just going to do an on-demand right here, right now, core dump. And so we can see that it generated a core dump and it put it in this um, location. You can use um, any of your core dump analyze engines that you have, whether that be DBG as a debugger or LLDB. Um, these are all 100% proper um, Linux core dumps. <laughs> 
Um, that goes the same for .NET, just an, as an FYI. There's nothing special about the .NET Core dump that comes out. Um, it can still be analyzed using all the standard um, tools. Now, let's say for HTOP, um, let's say we wanted to trigger um, a core dump of HTOP if the thread count goes over five. So we would specify dash T5. And now we notice that it is, um, you know, it hasn't generated a core dump like last time because it's monitoring for it. And so far, the thread count of HTOP has not gone to five. Um, now, HTOP is, is likely not an app that's going to use five threads. So let's see if it actually triggers on just, you know, if it's single threaded. So I specify dash T1. And then it detected that he's got one thread and a core dump was generated automatically. Now, if you're in a situation where there's some other process that's maybe periodically uh, consuming a lot of threads, maybe there is some issue with the thread pool or what, whatnot, this, this comes in really, really handy. So that's the demo for proc dump. Um, and then I'm going to hand it back to Kevin because so we've... Um, both Procmon and Sysmon rely on this technology called eBPF. Um, so far, as, you know, Kevin's talked about it at a higher level, but what he's going to do now is do a deep dive um, and kind of look under the covers a little bit and give you a better idea of, of how we work all that. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing, Kevin, so you can, you can take over. Excellent. Yeah, so I'll talk about the eBPF uh, internals for the next uh, 20 minutes or so, just to give you some idea of um, the sort of things that you can do with eBPF, the sort of things we've done with eBPF and how you might uh, make use of it. Um, I'm going to go through these things. So I'll talk a bit about eBPF in general. I'll talk a bit about how we use it in Sysmon. And I'll talk a little, very briefly about licenses because there's some interesting or interesting things there to be talked about. Oh. So... What is eBPF? Well, eBPF.io, uh, the website dedicated to it, says it is a revolutionary technology with origins in the Linux kernel that can run sandbox programs in an operating system kernel. It is used to safely and efficiently extend the capabilities of the kernel without requiring to change kernel source or load kernel modules. So the important things to pull out there are sandbox programs, meaning they run inside a virtual machine, in kernel, like literally inside the kernel, the virtual machine is inside the kernel. So safely and efficiently, because the programs are verified by a kernel verifier before they're loaded, and the API um, accessible to the eBPF programs is quite limited, and it's there to extend capabilities, um, i.e. to attach to trace points and K probes within the kernel so that your programs run when certain things happen. Uh, without changing kernel or loading kernel modules. So that implies without recompiling your kernel um, or rebooting in order to get this functionality. So the kind of a kind of use case that um, many people might find or might find useful and the sort of programs that we've talked about today use this kind of model. Um, other tracing programs use something similar, is if we have applications like we have out here on the right running in, in Linux on a Linux server, when they need to access resources such as start a new process, uh, access the network or read and write disk or any, any of a number of other things, they don't have direct access to do that themselves. They have to rely on the kernel to do it for them. And the way they do that is they make a syscall which uh, switches the task to the kernel. And often syscalls are wrapped in libc functions, um, although you can call them directly yourself. But when you make a syscall, the kernel takes over and the controller is handed to the syscall architecture within the kernel. Now, in there, the kernel will access the resource that the application has asked for and it will return the information back to the application, whether that's information that's requested or a return code to say that something was happened uh, successfully or, or failure. Now, with eBPF, eBPF programs kind of exist in two halves. We have the user land controller, which runs like pretty much any other application out in the normal, um, normal sort of Linux server space. And then we have the eBPF program itself, which runs inside the eBPF virtual machine inside the kernel. 
And user land controller would load and configure that eBPF program and insert it into the kernel. And then it would attach it to trace points or K probes within the kernel. So what you might want to do is attach your eBPF program to the entry point of the syscall architecture or the entry point for a specific syscall. Now, when an application makes a request for some resources and calls the syscall, that goes into the kernel and the kernel takes over. As it hits that entry point, uh, trace point, control will be handed to your eBPF program running in the kernel context, but within the virtual machine inside the kernel. Now, from there, it can access through APIs certain information about the kernel, such as the task struct and other kernel internals. It can store that information. Uh, it can transmit information back to the user land part of its uh, of the eBPF program. Uh, but when it's finished running, it will hand control back to where the trace point was, which is in this case at the start or the enter point of the syscall architecture. The syscall will then run as normal, and it will hit the exit point of syscall, syscall architecture, where you could have another program attached or the same program attached, um, where it can then access things like the return value from the syscall and see how, how that syscall occurred. Um, again, when the eBPF program is finished running, uh, control gets passed back to the exit trace point in the syscall architecture, and then control gets passed back to the application in user land. The application is usually completely unaware that an eBPF program has uh, been involved in that execution path, and the kernel pretty much is, is rather you know, oblivious to it itself. So there's two main ways of deploying eBPF programs or build and, and certainly building them. And obviously, depending on how you build them, you have different options. So and beyond these two, there are um, simpler methods for much more hands-on uh, interactive kind of uses of a BPF. But if you're building programs like Sysmon or Procmon, um, to, to kind of do rather large tasks, then you're probably going to want to use one of these two methods. So the first is BCC, the BPF Compiler Collection. In this situation, you provide your eBPF program as source code and compile it at the point of runtime on the machine that you're interrogating. So in the case of Procmon, it uses BCC currently. And so when you run, run up Procmon, it compiles its code on the fly using LLVM and Clang and inserts that into the Linux kernel where it then attaches to the syscall architecture and reports on all the syscalls back to the Procmon user land program. This um, obviously has a dependency on having a compiler like LLVM on the target machine. With Sysmon, we went a different route. We used libbpf, which is a library that allows you to load binary compiled um, eBPF objects directly into the kernel. And what this means is that you can compile your eBPF programs at build time into ELF objects and ship them to your target machine, and they can just get loaded in without needing to have LLVM on the target machine. Now, both of these typically require uh, BTF, that's BPF type format, to access kernel symbols um, and, and therefore to access kernel struts. But there are other ways of doing that, specifically if you're using uh, libbpf. So I'll quickly talk about um, kernel offsets and uh, BPF type format. Now, until recently, BTF hasn't been... Uh, uh, switched on or enabled in Linux kernels. So the vast majority of Linux kernels shipped with distributions have BPF already enabled, but they don't have BTF enabled by default. Newer kernels and newer, and newer distribution versions are doing so now, but um, if you're writing programs to run on other people's machines, you don't really want to have to rely on them to recompile their kernel in order to run your software. Um, and, and certainly, if you're running things in, in a, you know, live environments, recompiling your kernel and rebooting might be a bit um, uh, tedious or, or less, than, less than ideal. Another option 
to get access to BTF is to install a symbols package for the kernel, which you know is, is a perfectly reasonable thing to do, but you might not want to have kernel symbols on deployed or you know live machines. So what alternatives are there? Well, with the sysinternals eBPF library that I talked about earlier, what um, I've implemented a number of different ways to access uh, kernel offsets in absence of BTF. Um, the first option it takes is a configuration file. If you provide it with a configuration file, it will take that and assume that that is correct. And you can generate that configuration file using the supplied get offsets module. Now that get offsets module needs to be built against your kernel headers, but you don't actually need to load that module. We, we then just pillage the uh, symbols from the module itself and generate a configuration file from that. And there's a program to, to automatically do that. If you haven't done that, which, which you won't have done by default, the next port of call is an offsets database that we ship with sysinternals eBPF, which has been supplied uh, by Project Frita, and it contains over a 1,000 sets of offsets for kernels that are common in many distributions. So um, there's a good chance that if you're running an off-the-shelf kernel that uh, your, your particular kernel version and configuration will be in that database, and it will be able to pull the offsets from that um, and make use of those. If neither of those two work, um, then it falls back on automatic discovery of offsets using a memory forensics uh, approach. And the way we do this is we run a BPF program to dump the task struct of a known process, and then we search through that memory for information that we know, like the process ID is relatively unique in a task struct. And um, when we find it, we can check that we found the correct process ID and calculate the offset to it, knowing that every other process running on that machine will have the same offset for its process ID. Um, other things we can search for are like the COM, which is you know, the shortened form of the command that launched the program. That again is relatively unique um, and easy to search for, and that'll give us the offset to the COM. Now, between those two points, there are other things that we know will exist. And by uh, interrogating those pointers and looking at the memory that they uh, point to, we can find other things like the user identifier um, uh, and the, the group identifier. We can find the uh, full command line. We, we can pull the start and end of the code segments and, tech, uh, and data segments of userland programs. Uh, we can find the TTY uh, and, and numerous other, other offsets that are, that are really useful for us in generating events. So we can generate all of that. We can search for all of those for a process that we know and have checks and balances to make sure that they're correct, store those offsets, um, and then use them to um, annotate the kernel so that we can access the kernel internals for any process that's running on that machine. So the way we do that is we store those in a what's called a configuration map. So a map is a data structure that's shared between the user land and eBPF program. And so when the program starts up, um, it loads those offsets from the map. And then when it wants to access the kernel internals, it just uses the information in there to dereference uh, the offsets. And the eBPF uh, library that we provide um, contains functions to, you know, to do that dereferring automatically. This means that we can access kernel internals without needing BTF, which means on machines that don't have it on by default, you don't have to recompile your kernel and reboot, and you don't have to install a symbols package. You can just use um, our tools. So as I say, SysTotals eBPF is a shared library and it's a code library. And the code library comes with a number of other helpers or APIs which aren't already available within uh, BPF. Um, so some tracing programs will use the parameters provided to a syscall from a userland program. But as was demonstrated at DEF CON 29, that can fall foul to a phantom attack where the buffer is changed between the kernel reading the buffer and the tracing program um, reading the buffer. And, and logging it. So um, a different file to the one that was actually opened might be logged, or a different command line to the one that was actually run might be logged. Well, our helpers allow you to get access to 
information from the actual kernel internals rather than from the syscall parameters, and therefore we can avoid uh, those phantom attacks. They also provide things um, like uh, ways of sending events to user land via the perf ring buffer and reporting errors that might occur with that via a different map. Our basic approach to eBPF is typically to stick to trace points rather than k-probes. So the difference is, is a trace point is a very stable um, debugging point within the kernel that's compiled in. They rarely change. The parameters supplied to them rarely change. And they're very easy to attach to. Um, whereas k-probes are probes into the kernel, which can have literally attach to any instruction within the kernel. But in order to do so, you know you have to know which instruction to uh, connect to and what information you would expect to find. Um, so they can change much more frequently. Um, we're making maintenance, if you want to support multiple kernels like we do, uh, much more difficult. So with trace points, um, there might be two or three changes over the course of five years. With k-probes, there, there, there could be many, many more. So we tend to stick to trace points. And um, where raw trace points are available, um, which for syscalls they are from kernel 4.17 onwards, we favor raw trace points because they are faster, because they um, do less uh, parameter manipulation ahead of time, uh, which means that your load on your system is lower and, and therefore the impact of our tool is, is lower. Um, what we generally do is store the arguments to syscalls on the entry to the syscall architecture and then retrieve those on exit and also retrieve the return value and then access the memory um, that uh, the, the, the syscall has used. The reason for this is because memory gets paged out uh, as it's not needed and, and a, a, a user land function, a user land process might page out memory and when you come in on the sysenter you if you go to read that memory you'll you'll just get a page fault uh, and an error now usually and i'm sure people are aware if the kernel or user land program tries to access memory that's paged out a page fault occurs an interrupt happens uh, the, the the kernel pages that memory in and then reruns the instruction and it's seamless to the program in bpf typically programs can't sleep and therefore don't have access or the ability to want a page faults. And so instead of getting a page fault and the memory magically appearing, what happens with BPF is um, you get a page fault and no memory appearing and an error code. So by um, doing all of our work on the exit, it's much more likely that the memory we want to access has already been accessed recently by the syscall architecture and therefore is more likely to be paged in. Uh, and as I say, where possible, we avoid copying user land controlled buffers to avoid the phantom attacks that were mentioned at DEF CON. Um, other things we do is we check whether the situation that our program is running in is the right situation to for the events that we want to report. And if it's not, we exit early and quickly to reduce processor time on, on things that we're not going to report on to try and minimize the impact on the system. And BPF, I will say, is very, very lightweight. Um, the impact it has on the system is negligible compared with alternative solutions. And, um, and the other thing it is we do use trace points for things other than syscalls where appropriate. Um, there are some useful network reporting things and there's some useful reporting around process termination, for example, which you can't get through syscalls, but you can get by uh, attaching to the other thousand odd trace points that are available. Now I'm going to talk uh, a bit about some of the limitations on BPF um, because it's worth knowing. BPF has been evolving over a number of years and it gets better and better. But of course, if we want to target a wide range of kernels, going back to um, systems that are still running old machine, well, running old distributions or running old versions, then we have to take into account the limitations available and create a staged approach. So um, we where functionality is available, we'll make use of it, but um, we have to be able to support older kernels as well. So um, uh, earlier on, raw sys uh, calls didn't exist and then, and then they came into existence. Um, early on, the, the maximum size of a program was 4,096 instructions. 
Uh, that was listed to a million instructions in 5.2, but because the jump instruction uh, is limited to a sine 60 bit offset, that's kind of still limited to a million instructions. Uh, to, sorry, it's limited to 32,000 instructions, really, in practice. In kernel 5.3, we, we got the ability to have loops. So before that, we had to unroll all of our loops in the compiler, um, which made our code much bigger than it needed to be. Uh, by 5.3, we, we had loops. And um, from 5.6 onwards, we, we will have KRSI extensions, but we're currently not supporting those just yet, but we will be in the future. So um, another limitation to be aware of is that uh, LLVM Clang changes between versions in terms of its optimizations, and the kernel verifier gets smarter and smarter with every version of the kernel. What this means is that different versions of the compiler and different versions of the kernel um, interact differently with each other. And so it means some programs compiled on some versions of the compiler won't run on certain versions of the kernel and vice versa, which is kind of uh, challenging at times. So you, if you're building programs to run across multiple uh, kernel versions, then you need to bear that in mind and simplify your programs and find ways of testing across multiple kernels. I mean, some examples of the sort of things that we see are uh, the verifier that loads the program and checks it um, works out the range of values that a variable can take and then uses that to check that you're not trying to access an, like an array out of bounds, for example. Um, sometimes it doesn't interpret uh, bounds that you've placed on your variable correctly. Um, and so it thinks your variable could take numbers, you know, very, you know, values that, that it couldn't possibly take and then rejects your program as a result. Um, other times it correctly works out what the limitations are, but um, due to register limitations, uh, stores the variable after it's done its check um, and stores it on the stack and then later on retrieves it from the stack, doesn't do the check again and thinks that the variable could have any number of values and therefore believes that you've um, exceeded your array bounds when you when you haven't. Um, and sometimes Clang will optimize out uh, checks that you put in place specifically to make the verifier happy. So in all of those situations, I turn to inline volatile assembler to fix those things. And, and I find that is a pretty good solution. But obviously, it has its own drawbacks. Um, other things we're aware of, the perforing buffer is limited to 64K, but it's actually less than 64K by a, a, an amount that's configuration dependent. Um, you might want to send events that are bigger than that, in which case you will need to either fragment your events um, or truncate your events. Um, equally, before KRSI, the, the API is quite limited. There's no string functions and no path functions, et cetera. Um, and even with loops, uh, complexity in the verifier is limited to a million processed instructions. Um, so even though your code might be quite small, if it if it does lots of things in loops, um, the verifier may hit its hard ceiling of a million processed instructions anyway, and then reject it. But there are things called tail calls, which allows one BPF program to call another BPF program. And so that that might provide a reasonable solution to it, like store state uh, in maps call another BPF program, et cetera. Um, now, the stack in BPF is limited to 512 bytes, and there are no functions. You can't call functions. You, you can I say you can tail call, theoretically, from one BPF program to another, but you can't call another BPF function. So when I talk about functions uh, that we provide in our code library, they're all in line. Um, now, interestingly, um, you can have multiple cores, obviously, and your BPF program could be running on multiple, on multiple cores at the same time if, it's that, if the same trace point is hit by multiple programs. Now, if you want uh, memory to build your event before you send it to user land, the stack's not big enough. So you need a, to use some map memory to do so. But the per CPU arrays and hashes are limited to 32K, which might not be big enough for what you want. Now, you can hack around that by using the CPU ID as a key into a regular array. But then that does mean that at compile time, you need to specify how many cores you're going to support. So we support a maximum number of 512, but that could be changed through compiler options. Uh, so I'll quickly talk about um, Sysmon event generation because 
it explains a bit about how we use eBPF. So as I said before, we have a number of events that we support. And our program, uh, you know, this one is built on the Sys internal eBPF library. We attach the trace points. Um, when they run, you know, you know when, a, when a user land program issues a, a syscall, our, our programs run, they pull information from the task struct, they uh, attach extra information to build an event, they send that through the perf ring buffer back to user land, and uh, that event is then uh, filtered with the ported software from the Windows version of Syslog and then outputted to Syslog rather than the Windows event log. So the way we lay out the code, which is which is kind of interesting and probably worth talking about, is um, is designed to reduce code duplication and and to you know, reduce maintenance costs. So we have ultimately um, telemetry collection functions. They're all in line. And each one does one thing and lives in one source file. So um, if you have process creation events uh, attached to the exec VE syscall, then there'll be one telemetry function that attaches to that and it collects the, the correct information for a process creation event. Now that could be incorporated into a traditional syscall trace point program or a raw syscall trace point program. And so I so we have one source file for the traditional trace point and one source file for the raw trace point for that event. And both of them include the same inline function. And then we have EPPF kernel files, source files, which each one supports a range of kernels based around characteristics that are common. So um, the ones, the, the kernels before raw syscalls were available will only include traditional trace point, syscall trace point programs. The ones after that will only include the raw syscall trace point programs. But, um, but within there, we have a number of hash defines to uh, specify whether the instruction limit is 4096 or higher, whether loops are allowed or not. Um, and the idea here is that we end up with six eBPF kernel files, which compile to six eBPF kernel objects, um, ELF objects, which we load, and they draw on all of the other sources that, that we have in, a, in a, like this hierarchical fashion. So I'd say the idea there is, is to reduce our complexity. Um, now, traditional trace points um, are supposed to have a unique program um, a, or a unique set of uh, arguments. But um, if you think about syscalls, they can only ever have up to six arguments, and each argument can only ever be a 64-bit number. That number might represent an integer, a Boolean, or a pointer, or, or anything else. But there are literally only six arguments to a syscall, and everyone is a 64-bit number. So instead of having a specific syscall enter program for every trace point, we have seven. One for zero arguments, one for one, one for two, et cetera, all the way up to six. And for the raw syscalls, there literally is only one entry point, which is the entry point of the entire syscall architecture. So we have one generic entry point. Now on exit, we have an exit program for each type of telemetry we want to collect. So um, for traditional trace points, that uh, exit program would be attached to the syscall, the, the specific syscall exit point. And for raw, that would be connected to the the generic raw exit point for the entire syscall architecture. Um, so in the case of raw syscalls, um, there might be one exit point and we might have 20 programs attached to it. And in the case of traditional trace points, there'd be 20 exit points, one for each of the different syscalls that we might attach to. And then there's non-syscall trace points as well, of course. So uh, to walk through a worked example, if we were tracking um, the create file and specifically the create syscall isn't very popular these days because most uh, libc's use open app for this, but you could still use create. Um, we know it's got two parameters. So for a traditional syscall entry point, we'll use the generic enter two because two for two parameters. And for raw, we'll just use the generic raw enter. It uh, grabs the arguments to that syscall and uh, stores them in a hash using the process ID and thread ID as the key. Now, if you imagine that there's only one thread on the system that has that process ID and thread ID, and that process is, that thread is currently running a syscall, or trying to run a syscall, except our BPF program has intercepted flow at that point. 
when the enter program ends, the syscall gets run in the kernel and then it hits our exit point and runs our exit eBPF program. We still haven't returned to user land. There's still only one thread on the system with that PID and TID. So we can then use that PID and TID as the key into the same hash to retrieve those arguments. We can then annotate it with the return value, annotate it with other information and send the event to user land. Now, the way it annotates that and builds that event is they both of those uh, programs, the, the traditional syscall or the raw syscall uh, programs, call the same function, set file create info, in the same shared source file, sys1 file create.c. That is the telemetry collection inline function. And what it does is it builds the event. So it checks the return value. Now, um, for a create, the return value is the file descriptor. If it's less than zero, then it's an error and no file was created. But if it's more than zero, then it's a valid file descriptor. And so instead of just taking the argument to create, which would be the file that someone wants to create, we which could be vulnerable to a phantom attack where that buffer gets changed in user land between the kernel seeing it and sysmon seeing it, we take the file descriptor, look it up in the file descriptor table for that particular task. That maps us to a directory entry uh, which will give us a file name. We can map from there to the parent directory entry and get the directory that that file is in and then to the parent of that one and so on and so on until we've got the entire path, which we then part, put into an event, annotate it with information and send it back where it eventually ends up in user land. Now, the events transmit through the perf ring buffer. There is another ring buffer, the BPF ring buffer, which we will support in future for newer kernels. And um, that we monitor that in user land using the perf buffer poll function, which has a timeout. So that it, runs in a loop. Every time an event arrives in there, that calls the callback that we've specified. That callback uh, might correlate that event with other events when it needs more information, or it might annotate it with other information from the system, other information it knows. And then it sends it into a dispatch event, which is ported from the Windows sysmon. Um, which filters it based on the configuration that you specified when you started Sysmon, and ultimately that ends up building an XML message, which it sends to Syslog. So I know that has a lot to take in. <laughs> the last thing I'll quickly talk about is licenses, because these are slightly complicated, but BPF programs are typically GPL2. Uh, libraries that use them are typically LGPL2.1 because they interact with the GPL2 uh, interface and uh, programs that uh, map to the library can be any license and therefore in our case we are MIT with our BPF programs being GPL2. So what's next for Sysmon? Well I since releasing last week I've had a number of issues reported on GitHub and um, with a number of things that I'm going to look at and fix and uh, we'll be adding new events, uh, support for containers and support for BTF and other API things. Maybe Mario will be able to talk about Procmon. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Um, so Procmon was <clears throat> released before Sysmon um, came along, and uh, we also use eBPF, but we use a different um, abstraction layer for it, and it's BCC. That's what Kevin was talking about earlier in this in this talk. Um, our next thing that we want to do is we want to uh, move all of that over to the um, SysInternals eBPF library that. Kevin wrote and that he talked about. So that's kind of our immediate priority right now. That's going to enable us to more easily also open up the door to more um, Linux distributions. For ProcDump, um, one thing that we want to do is support uh, uh, for target process, process ID, PGID. So scenarios for that is if you have a parent process that ends up spawning a bunch of child processes to do the work, um, instead of having to monitor each one individually, you can just specify a PGID. Um, and the next thing that we want to do um, for .NET is uh, integrate with the counter. So the way that ProcDOM today gets the information that it needs to to interrogate the triggers that are specified, say CPU, is we just use ProcFS and we'll, we get all that stuff out of there. Um, for .NET, they have their own counters in the runtime. Um, some of those counters are very specific to .NET, and others kind of overlap, like the memory counter, um, but it's more accurate for .NET. So imagine that um, if, you, if you were just targeting um, a regular process, non.NET, maybe it's using 100 megs of, of memory, right? So that's, that's a pretty accurate 
representation of memory usage. If you kind of wrote the same app in .NET, the runtime itself will pre-allocate a bunch of memory, maybe like in 64 meg segments or whatever it happens to be. And if you then tell Procdump that you want to monitor the .NET process for memory usage, it's going to start triggering Procdump or dumps because of the fact that the, the managed heap had already pre-allocated a bunch of memory. So .NET exposes counters that more specifically, more accurately tells you what the .NET app is using or not. So we want definitely want that integration. Um, so that's it for the roadmap for Procdump. Um, and with that, I think we are, uh, this wraps it up. Actually, as a resources slide, again, all of the uh, sys internal tools for Linux are open source. They're available on these GitHub repos and any feedback, community contributions are greatly, greatly appreciated. So thank you very much. I hope, hope you all enjoyed this session on Sys internals for Linux and uh, we'll catch you on next time. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. That was very like, very deep and I actually enjoyed listening to all these eBBF details very much. So thank you for the talk and we are now heading to the discussion zone where you will have a chance to ask all your questions about all the details if you need them. So thanks guys and uh, hope you. to see you next time. Thank you.